I've defined scalar fields, so I want to start investigating their calculus, and calculus starts with limits, so I'll start there as well. In this video, I'll go through the limits of scalar fields and how to calculate them. I'll be doing this fairly briefly. These limits are useful and valuable, but most of the focus of the course will be, will move quickly on from limits to other tools. I'll start with the abstract formal definition. You may or may not be familiar with the so-called epsilon delta definition of limits from previous courses. These are the formal definitions of limits, and there is a version of this even for single, single variable calculus. I'm going to state this limit in its full formality, but I do not expect you to be able to work with the limit in that formal abstract setting. I just want you to be aware of that formal abstract definition. In any case, the first new thing about a scalar field limit is the fact that the approach is now in Rn, the domain of the scalar field. It's not just a limit as A approaches x, but a limit as a vector x1 to xn approaches a point a1 to an in Rn. Then the output, which is a scalar, does approach a particular scalar value L. The limit of the function approaching the point a1 to an is equal to L means that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that when the input is close to the special point within some tolerance delta, the output is also very close to the special value L within some small tolerance epsilon. This delta and epsilon language is the formal way of saying that as the input gets closer and closer to the point A1 to An, the output gets closer and closer to the scalar value L. Limits relate to continuity, and the definition here is the same as for single variable calculus. A function is continuous at a point if the limit and the value of the function are the same. That means there isn't some sudden jump or break in the graph of the function. One of the major techniques of multivariable functions will be to treat the input variables separately. This works really nicely for continuity. It is true, though I won't prove it here, that if a scalar field is continuous in each of its variables on their own, then it is continuous overall. So, to check continuity of some f of xy, I could check that it was continuous just as a function of x, and likewise just as a function of y, and if both were true, it would be continuous all around. Finally, the fact that I use more frequently for continuous functions than single variable calculus. Elementary functions, the standard functions we use, polynomials, roots, exponentials, trig, Elementary functions are continuous on their domains, and this doesn't have to be verified. This can be just taken as a fact to use. Now let me do some limit calculations. I'm not going to do too much of this again because the focus on limits in this course is, well, limited with apologies for the obvious pun. But I do want to do a little to give you a sense of what's going on. In this example, I show that the various algebraic manipulations will still help with calculating limits, even though the expressions now involve multiple variables. Likewise, the classification of limits into asymptotic types is still very useful. This limit is the limit in R2 as I approach the origin. Note that this includes all directions of approach to the origin. One of the new challenges of limits of scalar fields is that it isn't just limits from the left and the right now, but from infinitely many different directions of approach in the plane. This is a limit of type 0 over 0, since both the numerator and denominator approach 0. I would like to simplify this with algebra. The numerator is a difference of squares, so I can factor. Then, after factoring, I can cancel off the x minus y term. After doing so, what's left is a continuous function, so I can just evaluate and conclude that this limit is zero. Here's a more complicated example, but one that uses a technique that I taught in single variable calculus, multiplication by a conjugate. This is a limit of type zero over zero, since if you evaluate both the numerator and denominator at the point you're approaching, you would get zero. I have the difference of square roots in the denominator, so I multiply by the conjugate, the same expression, but with addition instead of subtraction. And I multiply both numerator and denominator by the same expression to keep equality. 
Then I distribute the denominator and cancel out the square roots. At the same time, I factor y out of the numerator. Doing this leads to the same term in the numerator and denominator, which I can cancel off. And that leaves me with a continuous function, which I can evaluate to conclude that the limit is 4. The point of these two examples is to show that, even though there are both x's and y's, many of the same algebraic techniques that we use for single variable limits still hold. In the last two examples, I want to show some interesting ways that limits can fail for multivariable functions. I said earlier that a complication with scalar field limits was the direction of approach. This can be used to prove that some limits are impossible. Consider this limit of a two-variable scalar field. I can approach the origin along any straight line, and a straight line through the origin is the equation y equals mx. If I approach on a fixed line, well, then I can replace y with mx in the expression, and that turns this into a single variable limit. With that replacement, I can do some algebra here, multiplying out, factoring out the x squared and cancelling off, and I get this expression for the limit. m is the slope of the line of approach. If m equals 1, then this evaluates to 2, but if m equals 2, then this evaluates to 9 fifths. This means that the limit depends on the line of approach. And since there are different values for the limit depending on how you approach it, it is impossible for this limit to exist. Here is a similar example, but one where I choose a different path of approach. Instead of approaching along straight lines, I can approach on any path of the origin. Here, I approach on quadratic paths where x equals m y squared for various m giving wide or narrow parabolic paths. Along a fixed path, I can again make a replacement and evaluate the single variable limit. For different choices of m, I get different values to the limit, and that shows me that this limit likewise cannot exist.